Good evening and uh, welcome to this event, which is part of the spring series of open lectures produced by the University of York. Our subject tonight, parallels with the pandemic, living through coronavirus and World War II, similarities and differences. I'm Colin Philpott, I'm a member of the court of the university, that's the university's advisory body. Um, I'm also an author of three uh, non-fiction books about the history of the 20th century, two of which are about the Second World War. And it's my great pleasure this evening to be hosting this event. Thank you for joining us wherever you are in the world. I imagine many of you may be some distance from York, um, and I hope you find the next 60 minutes interesting and illuminating. Um, a few technical things to explain. Should you have any issues such as loss of Wi-Fi, you can rejoin the event um, using the original link. Hopefully that will get you back in touch with us should that happen. Um, if you're watching live, you will be able to ask questions of our speakers um, throughout the event using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And we'll, I'll see them in front of me and um, we'll try and get as many of those uh, uh, for our panelists to answer as we can. Uh, during the event. Live captioning is available. Uh, if you'd like to switch them on or off, you can do so via the closed captions or live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. And please remember that this event is being recorded, so you will be able to watch it again on YouTube in a few days' time and also share it with friends and your networks uh, who may be interested. You can also use hashtag York Ideas to join in the conversation on Twitter. Now, during the two years of the coronavirus pandemic, many comparisons have been drawn between the experience of living through COVID and living through the Second World War in particular. Fear, restrictions on liberty, concern over shortages and several other anxieties uh, have been hallmarks or were hallmarks of both. Morale and people's willingness, uh, which has varied uh, during the pandemic, uh, to comply with regulations, it's ebbed and flowed during wartime as it has during COVID. Uh, and one clear characteristic of the pandemic has been the use of military language to describe what some have called the battle against COVID. So what lessons, if any, can be drawn from the two experiences, war and pandemic, which may be useful in future crises? And we're particularly thinking here about language and communication used during both crises, and also about morale and about people's willingness to uh, comply with rules and guidance. Uh, to try and help unravel all of this, um, I'm going to be helped by our panel, who I'm delighted to introduce. Uh, Brooke Rogers is Professor of Behavioural Science and Security at King's College London. She's a social psychologist specialising in risk and threat communication and of particular relevance to our discussion uh, today. Brooke participates in SAGE, the group advising politicians and policymakers during the pandemic, and she's co-chaired one of its subgroups, the Independent Scientific Pandemic Insights Group on Behaviours, more easily known as SPIB. Professor Joe Fox is the Pro Vice-Chancellor for Research and Engagement at the University of London. She's a specialist in the history of propaganda particularly during the two world wars. She's currently involved in a project looking at COVID-19 rumors in a historical context. Dr. Franziska Colt is a specialist in science communication. She's a research associate in the sociology department here at the University of York, and has been involved in research into many aspects of the communication of science, including a study during the current pandemic. Um, Briefly, let me explain our format for the next hour. I've asked each of our panellists to speak for five minutes or so to set out their main thoughts on these issues. Then we'll have a discussion, picking up on what they have to say. But there will be time uh, also for your questions, comments and observations. And as I mentioned and earlier, the way to get involved in that is to add your questions to the Q&A box. Uh, and I'm sure we'll have plenty of questions and we'll try and get through as many of them as we can. So let's kick things off. I'm going to ask Brooke first to explain the role that she has been playing in the management of the COVID pandemic and to give us a bit of an insight into the behavioural science which has been influencing the messaging associated with it here in the UK. Over to you, Brooke. Thank you so much, Colin, and good evening to everyone. Um, it's, uh, it's going to be lovely to see you at, uh, when we all start the discussion as well. 
Um, I'm really, really uh, happy to be able to join you. Um, quite a few of the roles that I've been engaging in around COVID are decreasing in intensity, so I can really um, enjoy academic engagement to a greater extent, and this is one of my first opportunities to do so. So um, thank you, Susanna, for your kind invitation. So Colin and I had a chat before um, we are joined tonight, and he really wanted me to explain the way in which some of the um, independent academic advice uh, around behaviors was, uh, was fed into the government uh, decision-making processes. So I am a participant in SAGE, the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies in the UK, and I've been engaging with them um, for many, many years. I, I, I lost track of when I first started engaging in government exercises, looking at their practical approaches and saying, have you considered this? It could be more effective if you tried that or even reinforcing when the evidence suggests that we can do so. SPI-B is one of multiple subgroups that feed into the SAGE process. And we very much look at trying to enable behaviors or inform behaviors um, so that, that individuals can understand the, the event. Um, SAGE can be stood up from, for any uh, event that really, really stretches the capacity of the government to respond. That can be um, ash cloud from a volcano. It could be um, a, a terrorist attack. It could, it could be anything that's really going to um, st stress and stretch our capacity. So the topics range and the membership or participation, because we're not actually members, we're volunteers, um, changes as well. So the way in which these uh, subgroups work is that we um, operate uh, on, on a consensus, through a consensus process, where we have many, many members within our subgroup. Um, we're not permanent, we are independent, we are voluntary. For SPI-B during this um, COVID response, we had a range of expertise ranging, ranging from health psychologists to social psychologists, um, behavior change specialists, anthropologists, ethicists, legal and criminology experts, and of course, historians, because we can look back at previous pandemics to understand some of the public response and try to think about how that applies to current and future pandemics as well. We're very much um, based on uh, uh, trying to bring academic rigor and, um, and independent evidence into the process. And that can be through journal articles that are already published, um, data sources from around the world that we have access to through our networks that we can draw upon. And we've also really, really been able to change the way in which SAGE operated with Patrick Valance and Chris Whitty pushing and pushing with our support to make all of the publications and the minutes public. Normally, if SAGE sits, and for example, they sat for four times for um, Ebola in the past, it was unheard of that we would stand up for over two years. We've had over 100 meetings, and we very, very much thought that that information should be made public along the way. So we have consensus processes within SPI-B, which also has subgroups. We have consensus processes with the task and finish groups where we join forces with the modelers. Um, and then those reports and that thinking goes up to SAGE, which runs its own consensus process as well. And that consensus advice is then fed into the government, who, of course, is very much having uh, considering a range of views. We don't go into the operational aspects and they have to make decisions based on the range of views that are presented. If I think about the ways in which just the basic functioning of this for SPI-B. Um, if we think about some of the key principles where we're working with the epidemiologists, we're working with the infectious disease specialists, and they really had a challenge about trying to decrease and reduce transmission. And so some of the behaviors that we needed to think about were behaviors that would reduce the number of contacts per day, reduce exposure of vulnerable groups, reduce probability of infection per contact, reduce the, and reduce the number of susceptible people. So if those are the epidemiological principles, SPI-B would come in and say, well, what are the behavioral principles and what are, what are the evidence bases that we can apply to that? And we're very much focused, we focus on seeking to maximize the effectiveness of the above by um, finding ways of providing a credible rationale for guidance about any changes or any uh, behavior changes that are being requested. We um, are constantly emphasizing the role of transparency um, and feedback, 
We've uh, provided a lot of advice on the importance of and ways to engage all sectors of society through co-creation solutions and allowing time for sector planning and really, really trying to focus on enabling changes. So if you're asking individuals to engage in certain behaviors, are you providing the support, let's say for isolation, if they're on zero hour contracts, if perhaps they don't have sick pay, is there something that we can do to make it easier if people want to engage in the behaviors, um, but would struggle to do so? Um, a lot of our messaging focused on the use of positive messaging instead of an individual level, really focusing on that, the um, collective response, protecting one another and standing together um, and avoiding messages based on fear or disgust, disgust along the way. Um, and we also emphasize the importance of um, not focusing on punishments for breaching advice or guidance, but really, really um, trying to highlight, highlight the areas in which we're all working together. We have a number of theories I won't go into today, protection motivation theory, Calm B, which is another behavioral theory, and the many, many theories that my anthropology colleagues and sociologists and historians have brought to the table. But I would say that it was a very challenging time. We were often working through the night on top of our day jobs, trying to run departments, trying to deliver online le um, lectures, trying to homeschool children. Um, it was such a collective effort, and it still is. We, we're on standby, so we haven't fully stood down yet. But some of our greatest hits, if I think about some of the successes where colleagues feel quite um, like we made a difference because of the evidence that could be brought to the table was in changing the framing of public behavior, challenging some of the behavioral science notions that policy colleagues presented to us. So they would present to us options that they were considering and we would respond and say, well, evidence supports this or, um, you know, possibly um, it, it, there are other options that might be more effective. And for example, the uh, assumption that members of the public would riot and that we would see buildings being burnt down in the streets, we very much were able to change that rhetoric more into that collective response and enabling behavior. We also made a case, a very strong case for um, considering the uh, and and um, considering the wider impacts of what we call the non-pharmaceutical interventions. So what are the wider impacts on children if the schools are closed, on mental health and well-being, um, on loneliness and, and on development if we're thinking about children again. Um, we pushed forward the community champions pro um, a pro a program looking at engaging on a community level, especially for those seldom heard communities where levels of trust might be an issue, um, looking at opening up larger events, et cetera, et cetera. I could go on. We've been incredibly busy behind the scenes. There are challenges, there are successes, and there was a lot of learning taking place as well in terms of the intensity of this engagement, the level of this engagement, and the length of time over which we have engaged. I'm going to pause here um, in order to make more room for um, questions and answers. And I would also really, really like to pass over to my colleague, Jo, in order to hear about her work in this area. Thank you very much, Brooke, and thanks to Susanna for inviting me. I'd just like to take us back to March 2020, two years ago. It all felt very unreal, all very alien. But then again, on another level, it was all very familiar. Those immediately recognizable propagandistic images, texts, phrases, slogans, and the emotions that they evoke and provoke from the Second World War, reappearing once again, just as they had after the 7-7 bombings, when needed, a kind of anchor for an unsteady sh ship in a stormy sea, remobilized at times of crisis. These propagandistic reimaginings are at once familiar and nostalgic, although not for all, a warning or prescient in some way, grounding and disruptive. Could I have my first slide, please? Thank you. Of course, there was the inevitable comparison between Churchill and Johnson, and here two propagandist Im images blended into one social media posting, simultaneously mobilizing the iconic image of Churchillian defiance with the design of the early Ministry of Information posters. The Ministry of Information was Britain's 
wartime propaganda agency and they were blended here with the position of the crown above the message unmistakably a marker of those early wartime propaganda posters that have translated of course into our present the most memorable being the much debated and referenced keep calm and carry on can i have the next slide please well, you can't really see this, but the official statements also carried the language of MOI propaganda briefing documents, particularly from the year 1940. And much of the language in this number 10 Downing Street briefing, including the underlinings, the format, the capitalization, the framings, will be very familiar to those who've read through the MOI policy papers. Next slide, please. Now, all such references, of course, were invested with added poignancy by the fact that the 75th anniversary of D-Day fell right in the middle of the early crisis. We All Meet Again became the lockdown anthem, sending Dame Vera Lynn with Catherine Jenkins to number one in the charts in early April 2020. World War II veteran Captain Tom Moore occupied that same venerated position with his version of You'll Never Walk Alone with Michael Ball. The commemoration of VE Day on the BBC culminated with a version of We All Meet Again sung by frontline workers. The intervention of the Queen through her message to the nation not only invoked the wartime spirit through image and word, but connected directly to memories of her father's radio addresses to the nation throughout the war years, her call to the national spirit and compassion for quote, those feeling a painful sense of separation from their loved ones drew directly on wartime experiences, including her own, of course. And if that, that were not evidence enough, the Queen reassured us herself that we will meet again. As with the propaganda of the war years itself, reassurances from above, from the monarchy, from the government, were supplemented by commitments to national resilience from the population as a whole. And this is an example from the evening Glasgow Times. Next slide, please. Of course, in a strange repetition of contemporary public skepticism of the Blitz spirit, the reimagined campaigns of 2020 challenged subversive behaviours, those that push against the communal spirit and encourage social sanction and condemnation of acts that ran counter to the notion of sharing or all being in it together. In the early days of COVID, this centred on hoarding and panic buying. Toilet roll was the key commodity here, as in this posting. The Blitz spirit hashtag was used on social media to point to profiteering, exposing those seeking to make a quick financial win from a national crisis. But also, next slide please, using iconic images of the war as a vehicle for a boosting dose of humor this was my favorite of these examples partly because this image of a milkman continuing his deliveries amidst the rubble so we think and what re it really showing is itself contested here he's holding a, a six rolls of andrex these are just some illustrative examples why do we instinctively turn to these ideas in challenging times of course, they're the obvious reasons of anchoring our present, the reassurance that we've overcome adversity before and we can do it again. The comforting belief that resilience is somehow built into our national DNA, only to be triggered and brought to life in difficult circumstances, a sense that it all somehow comes good in the end. As with all successful propaganda, these ideas gain traction because we want them to be true. There's a psychological benefit to hearing them. And in some cases, they correlate to the stories we like to tell ourselves about our past, stories we've heard numerous times in many contexts, quite often close to home. A cynic might conclude that such narratives also serve as a useful distraction from political failure. The warm nostalgic glow of past glories may make us less alert to what was then a perception that there was absence of testing or PPE or inaction at critical moments. And it's a kind of seductive propaganda that was used so beautifully during the Dunkirk evacuation of May to June 1940 to give us what we ultimately want at a time of despair that everything will be all right, 
that setbacks can lead to victory, that our spirit will carry us through despite any lack of resource planning or capacity. The question for me is, does this story have a shelf life? Will it survive retellings as memories become ever distant, ever more distant, where connections are lost between generations that experience World War II and how our interpretation of the Second World War itself is changing? How much longer will this remain relevant to a new generation with different conceptions of the role of the past in British identity? I, think, I hope that's given a little overview of some of the things that I noticed as a historian of propaganda in the Second World War in those early days of COVID. And I'm going to hand over to Francisca. Thank you so much, Joe. And I think that sets excellently um, the stage for what is about to follow. I'm also very grateful to the expertise and the perspectives of the two speakers that preceded me. Um, I'm coming at this event as the resident science communication person, but I'm also a historian of science. So when we started monitoring the communication, the narrative framings chosen for COVID-19, I was doing this specifically through the perspective of what constitutes good practice in science, health and risk communication, but also what has historically worked well. And I'll get into what that actually means um, in a second. So while as a science communication expert, I can usually say, well, this particular type of communication in theory does work or doesn't work very well, as whereas being a science historian also allows me to be the particularly annoying person in the room who goes, told you so, yep, yeah, I knew that. So we're a delightful bunch. So finding out the chosen narrative framing of the UK um, didn't take very long. What Joe has described was almost immediately chosen as a framing. Boris Johnson almost immediately declared his cabinet dealing with the novel coronavirus a war cabinet. And we quickly became used to phrases such as frontline workers, fire breaks and vaccinations as a weapon in the arsenal in the battle against COVID and clung on to the hope that it may all be over by Christmas. So why am I highlighting this as a unique or special thing? Why are we talking about this as a uniquely British COVID warfare experience? Well, after all, was Britain the only country using such language? And the answer is, well, no. France's president, Emmanuel Macron, also declared war on the pandemic very early on. And in the US, the framing had also taken hold. Andrew Cuomo said things like, ventilators, this is a quote, ventilators are to this war, what bombs were to World War II. And I'll leave you to judge whether this metaphor does or doesn't work. All I'll say is when I had one of those stuck in me, I was quite glad it didn't explode in my face. But there was something about the whole language that was, and the whole experience that was unique. And because of time reasons, I will only give you one example for it. The first time that the then health secretary, Matt Hancock, responded to the huge loss of life of health workers during the pandemic, he did so in the following fashion. And this is a quote. This morning at 11 o'clock, we paused to remember the 85 NHS colleagues and the 19 social care colleagues who have lost their lives with coronavirus. They are the nation's fallen heroes, and we will remember them. Most of you will recognize this as the formula, as that of Remembrance Sunday, which commemorates the fallen of the two world wars. But there's also more to this. The Remembrance Day service has religious origins and still proceeds into Westminster Abbey. And throughout the pandemic, ministers referred to SARS-CoV-2 as an evil or a devilish virus and our freedom from it as a God-given right. This is a phrase Boris Johnson actually used. They referenced phrases from popular hymns and innumerable religious tropes, such as, for instance, the sacrifice of health workers. And that combination was unique. Now, was this a good or a bad idea? So this is where I come in with my science communication hat on. And my contribution to this will be just to give a few reasons why this might not have been a very good narrative choice for a health crisis, even though, as Joe explained, it does give us those warm, fuzzy feelings of nostalgia of something virtuous that is somehow in the British DNA. Well, firstly, there were some narratives of a, some very 
evident examples of the narrative not working. Um, this narrative, for instance, directed actions in the opposite directions of medical time, guidance at times. I'm sure some of us will remember the VE day street parties at the height of lockdown, and it was narratives that constantly vowed to bring the nation together at a time when medical advice encouraged us to stay at home to save the NHS. Isolation and emphasized social distancing, the narrative literally made enough people act in a diametrically opposed direction as that of medical guidance. This falls short of the purpose of narrative in science communication to clarify and to amplify. And the last thing a narrative should do is to obfuscate or invert the advice it ought to communicate. Secondly, the sacrifice narrative in particular sat very badly with a lot of health workers, especially in the longer term of the pandemic. They felt as if their deaths were being accepted as part of the process and that their voices calling for more armor for their battle, more PPE, was not seized upon by the government with equal vigor as their deaths. Thirdly, as narratives as these seek to bring people together and as in a war seek to encourage morale, in health settings, this effect can wear off very quickly and turn into disappointment, especially when defeat never comes. Reality jars, especially with narrative, and particularly concerning is that this very often leads to a loss of trust in those communicating in this way. As most science communication literature will ensure you, this is one of the key ingredients for messages to get across and to be followed through. And we're seeing this right now with a seemingly endless pandemic, and it doesn't have the quite, quite distinct ending point as a war. There is feelings of frustration. And finally, as this narrative acted almost as religion, it polarized in such a way as to reinforce fissure lines already present in society through other divisive issues and accusations of heresy or lack of patriotism were just around the corner and can lead to dangerous actions. A study conducted here at the University of York highlighted especially the discomfort felt by teachers who were at one point told by a prominent public figure that they lacked courage and should be more willing to sacrifice their lives which runs entirely counter to good risk communication, which should aim to reduce morbidity and mortality and not encourage it. So it is little wonder that research generally agrees, no matter if it comes to HIV, cancer or COVID, that war narratives in medical settings are, to quote a colleague, unfortunate, ironic, and unnecessary. And when we, we released our article on this, I got so many responses from people saying, oh, I wish they'd stop talking about cancer like a battle too, as they felt so strongly that their loved ones who had passed away from the disease were not coward, cowards or deserters or weak from dying for it. And the same was true for COVID. And there are, that there are alternatives is something we will hopefully explore in our conversation that we're about to have. And that there are also reasons why other narratives might work better. But at this point, I will hand back over to our chair, Colin, to lead this discussion. Thank you, Fran. <clears throat> Thank you also, Joe. Thank you, Brooke. Some really interesting um, ideas to start off our discussion. I want to go back and pick up with each of you some, to clarify some of the points. And we've also had a number of questions in um, from our audience, which is great. And we will get to those shortly. And don't forget that if you want to ask a question, just use the Q&A um, uh, &A button uh, and I will see the questions in front of me and I'll try and get through as many of them as we can. But I think the place to start is to talk about the, 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 the use of military metaphors and particularly the references to the Second World War. And I, Joe, can I put you on the spot first, please? Because, you know, Fran has given us a very sort of clear view that she feels that there were dangers in that approach yeah. um, and that it wasn't the right thing to do. You know, you've looked at the Second World War, you've spent a lot of your academic career looking at the Second World War and language used in the Second World War. Do you, do you agree with what she said? Yeah, I think I think that's right. Well, what's interesting to me is, you know, not I mean, I'm coming at it a slightly different perspective. My, why I'm interested in that is that why do we reach for it? Why do we go there in the first place? Because it was both invoked from above 
and and that is really where you know some of Brown's points come come in really quite quite powerfully. Should then uh, the the authorities have reached for that, n knowing that that so that it it. it provokes these kinds of reactions. But then there's the automatic, sort of slightly organic reaching for that narrative. And we saw a lot of that across social media, in the press. This was the natural place for, people, for, for, for the public to go. And I, I find that as a historian, I find that very interesting, even though you know, you, the, the historic dif distance is getting greater and that they're that the distance between the generation that experienced that and and now is 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 the gulf is widening we we still go there and we go there in all kinds of circumstances i mean the the, the other comparator i think i just referenced it was the 77 bombings we we went there almost directly with the the picture of um the the blitzed bus and on the front of the mirror with the bombed bus on Tavistock Square. Um, there, were, there were numerous references to the Second World War then with the, with the same kinds of narratives. So I think that there needs to be a distinction between certain responsibility for those responsible for the messaging and those in power. But then we also historically need to understand why that's our key reference point, why we go to those war narratives, both First and Second World Wars at times of crisis. And just on, on Fran's particular point, though, about, in a sense, sort of the danger of it, is it the idea that you can win a war and it'll be over and on a day, you know, you can declare peace. And I suppose most of us, if we think back to it, knew that when this thing started, it wasn't going to end quite as neatly as that. Yeah. Um, and indeed, it hasn't ended. Um, you know, is there a real danger? Do you, do you agree with uh, Fran's point that there is a real danger of building up frustration and disappointment, and more than that, you know, and anger, actually, about about sort of the idea that it's all going to be over quite quickly or it's yeah. going to end in you know, well, some well, understandable yeah. way. Well, we saw the dangers of that during the First and Second World Wars themselves, mm. actually, you know, that idea that this would be quick and fast, I, whether you were looking at Nazi Germany, the idea of Blitzkrieg and that this would be, you know, that period from um, the invasion of Poland up to the fall of France, that also gave an impression that things would be over quickly. And as things drew on, war weariness set in same in same in, in in Britain in the first world war the conflict will be over by Christmas when that doesn't manifest itself that breakdown in trust happens war weariness sets in despondency and so on it's it happened in the war itself but but we also have to remember there wasn't an immediate break point at the end of the second world war although the conflict may have been over in Europe and, and then in the Pacific, the consequences of war were much more, much longer lived. You know, that, that post-war rebuilding, you know, there was, there was trauma, there was economic consequences. I mean, th this, this is a lot longer. So we often see that as, as the break point, but it, but it wasn't. The issues of war weariness um, work here too. And, and Fran's absolutely right to point out that these kinds of immediate narratives, this blitz spirit narrative, they're very short lived. They only last for short periods of time. We saw it here in, in 2020, it fizzled out. Interestingly, that also happened in Britain in the Second World War to such an extent that Churchill uh, implored propagandists to reinvigorate the blitz spirit, those campaigns. Let's get those campaigns out again in 1943. The propagandists were a bit more sceptical. This isn't going to work now. And it's it all comes down to this point of it, it has a particular moment and a particular function. OK, um, Brooke, can I just go back to something you said, which I just wanted to explore a little bit more, which was the point about where you felt you had, you know, as, as a, a part of SAGE, made a difference to thinking about things. You, the, the thing you particularly mentioned that, that uh, I noticed was this idea that was about that people were going to riot, you know, if there were food shortages or difficulties, there'd be riots in the streets and all of that. And um, so, so just say a little bit more about how that discussion unfolded, if you can. Okay, well, I think that it's important to acknowledge that that kind of discussion has been um, taking place for, uh, for uh, I don't know, even since then, I have to go back to the first article, but I would say, um, probably over 20 years, 30 years, really looking at public responses to extreme events. So not just a pandemic. Um, and there is a popular concept when we think about extreme events called the myth of the panic prone public. And it very much recognizes that you can't just think about 
public responses to uh, a, a difficult situation as being always in the Hollywood movie mode, where it's always at the extreme of over response, demanding things, fearing things, running away from things. And our media has a very important role to play in that. And, and I could go through and find examples of newspaper images and media images. I use some in some of my presentations where um, members of the public are standing at a candlelit remembrance ceremony, calmly walking by pictures of people who had been um, lost during a terrorist attack. And the headline was saying that they were running away in panic. And so we, when we see uh, something like a terrorist attack taking place and, and you see people running away from it, it's very much framed as panic, where in reality, it's quite a rational response to remove yourself from something that is dangerous. Um, we also see um, people running towards that danger to help other people, to support other people. And we call that pro-social behavior. So there's a very long-standing and extensive research around pro-social behavior, helping behaviors during extreme events. And I would say that that is much more the norm. Um, and we argue with a lot of our research across a variety of events and colleagues around the world have argued that we need to consider behavior as being um, on, a, on a continue on a spectrum. And in reality, the quite often the government worry is that if they talk about something that's unfamiliar, that's possibly frightening, um, that people will panic. Um, and, and therefore that can change the way in which you communicate about it, that fear of public panic. Um, and also the, the policy responses uh, that you put in place. And that trickles all the way down to the emergency services, to the health services, et cetera. If you think about the police use of kettling, for example. So there are certain policy approaches and certain practical approaches and communication approaches that can actually become a self-fulfilling prophecy almost. If you're worried that members of the public are panic and you try to put things in place to stop them from panicking, some of those steps can actually make it more likely that they will panic. So all of the research in this area really encourages um, policymakers and practitioners to think about behavior along a continuum, ranging from under response to over response. And to be honest, under response is more problematic and more likely in many cases, especially if it's a health issue, than over response. So if we think about obesity, if we think about um, people hearing a fire alarm and thinking it's not a real fire, so they're going to finish what they're doing, finish sending that email, and then maybe they'll wander down the steps to the usual gathering point. So under response can be quite problematic and dangerous. Um, it can be a health threat. We saw that earlier with swine flu, um, where the hands face, uh, no, catch it, bin it, kill it, um, type of uh, communication um, is effective if people are seeing it and reading it, but wasn't actually leading to behavior change because um, members of the public didn't actually, uh, many members of the public didn't actually see uh, the risk of swine flu as something that was very risky for them. Um, and, and again, that's going back to the protection motivation theory, which has been around since the 50s, going into the COMB models, et cetera, saying, if you're going to communicate about a risk or threat, you need to make that communication relevant to the communities you want to communicate with. And if you're going to raise their awareness of a risk or threat, you actually need to tell them what they can do about it in order to protect themselves or their loved ones. And if it's going to be challenging, and we would go into talking about coping appraisals, if it's going to be challenging them for, for them to do that, if you think about Hurricane Katrina and asking people to evacuate, and they don't have transportation or they can't leave their pets or loved ones or they don't have anywhere to go, um, how can we make it easier for them to follow that advice? So I would say that what we did with our evidence um, was really, if policy, if certain approaches were being considered, they would, uh, they would have certain things that they were considering and we could say the evidence in this area suggests with a high level of certainty, medium or low level of certainty, that, um, that this would be an effective way to, to do, a thing to do, et cetera, et cetera. So we could really have conversations around that. And that's really how we've worked throughout. Um, if certain things are being considered and we have to be commissioned in order to actually respond, commission doesn't mean pay, it means we have to be asked. And I'll just talk one quickly, I'll finish this by saying that the guidance 
um, it's not guidance at all. The advice um, that goes out from SAGE um, is available to the policymakers, but we also do, so we do much more detailed reports where we're showing our work, where you can see us coming together, referencing everything, et cetera, et cetera. But we also have policy briefs, one or two pages that the policymakers might have time to read. But there's a lot more engagement behind the scenes. And we we really evolved into this and um, where we're, we're engaging with the departments themselves who have to think through the policies and deliver those policies. And they're more interested in those very detailed reports that will give examples of how to do something, will give case studies, will give international comparisons. And so while you might not always see the advice translated into the communications, we can't get involved with the communications themselves or the government decisions, a lot of times behind the scenes, you would see it trickling into um, the way in which some of the policies and decisions were actually implemented in that finer detail along the way. Okay, that, that, that's, that's interesting. Um, right, we're having some great questions coming in uh, from our audience. I'm going to uh, pick up on actually three questions which sort of touch on the same territory. And I, I might throw these in your direction, Fran, if I may. Um, Fiona Malcolm says, says this, I'm curious about the difference in narrative that we heard from the UK government and from the devolved nations. Fiona lives in Scotland. Um, <coughs> Gabriella asks, were there any governments that used non-war framing in their COVID communications? And uh, uh, Brigitte uh, says, alternative metaphors or no metaphors were used in Germany and New Zealand, for example, one focusing more on science, the other on teamwork. Because I think the, the comparisons between how different countries and different political leaders framed all of this is quite fascinating. Absolutely. And that was fascinating too. And um, I, I love that the question, the first question you chose was actually about the devolved nations, because whenever, whenever I speak about this research, one of the first questions is, well, did anyone react differently? And the answer is yes. And you don't even need to speak different languages for that. Because looking, for instance, at New Zealand and Scotland, they are fantastic examples because they didn't use the war language at all. So we monitored this by by hand we read all of the various things but we also did a computerized analysis so um you know data doesn't lie but you know we could really see there was the numbers were tiny of any sort of references to battle or something like that but that was the most you got whereas the you know the westminster communication was very very different um our algorithm uh, uh sorry our, our scripts nearly exploded because there were so many references the interesting thing is there is research um firstly on different narratives at the time of covid but also different narratives in historical pandemics in the UK. So there's two comparisons you can draw there. Um, I'll start with the first one. Um, you'll notice very quickly that the two examples I chose, Scotland and New Zealand here, have one thing in common. They have a female head of government. Um, so that was particularly interesting because there were other studies that studied particularly the communication of political leadership. And one trend we really saw emerging was male leaders use war language more than female leaders. Um, looking at the particular national settings, we also saw that nations with an imperial history tend to use them more than others. And so that also relates to the devolved nation. But one particular example that came up there, which is a non-English speaking country is Japan. Japan used this language as well. So this is interesting because there's also a history of empire there. The second um, question about alternative narratives there is the one um, where it also like to look a little bit at the British history of um, pandemics or epidemics um, because there, there is differences but also um, negligible in terms of reference um, in, in terms of comparison um, and rhetoric um, that I will leave to one side here but for instance in the cholera pandemic of the 19th century of the epidemic various waves of epidemic that Britain um, experienced even before it was known that um, cholera was waterborne the flood narrative was used quite a lot. And we saw that particular language used, for instance, in Germany a lot, where the there was no battle against COVID, no war against COVID, but there was talk of Eindämmung, 
building dams around COVID. And that's really interesting because I also do training workshops for institutions, um, large national institutions, for instance, the Church of England, um, where we reflect on the effect of such, such narratives. How do you feel if I say you're fighting a war? Of course, you want to be brave. You want to run into the battle lines and show that you're brave there and you don't mind losing your life because that's what bravery looks like in this setting. But think of yourself in front of a tsunami. There's a massive wave coming. There's nothing you could do about it. You put distance between yourself and this massive wave. And there's also a second element to it. You'd expect for your government to be prepared for it. So that was really interesting that it both evoke completely different sets of expectations, comparable, but notably different. And so the response, um, and we can measure that, is also different. So I think I'll come to a close here so we get some other perspectives in as well but yes you're absolutely right there are patterns that we can spot there and there are alternative narratives that we can say you know make people react differently as well okay um one other thing that i, I i'm interested in about this is i mean in a sense putting the language to one side but making the actual comparison between the experience of living let's say in Britain, it's not just about Britain, but just to, to focus it somewhere during the Second World War and living in Britain during the pandemic. And if I can bring in my own mother, who's in her late 80s, and in fact, part of the sort of recent discussion that led to this session was some conversations that, that I had with my mom when the pandemic was unfolding. And she said, it's really like the war. She, she was a child during the, during the Second World War. Uh, and the fear, she, she said, it's a different fear. The fear then, the primary fear was of bombing. The primary fear here was of disease, wasn't it? And, and all of that. I mean, Joe, do you think if, if you actually compare what people faced in the Second World War and what they have faced over the last two years, you know, what, what, what's similar and what's different? Is it a valid comparison, do you think? I, I think I'd be very careful about those, those comparisons, actually. I mean, what I would say, uh, can, if I just take the, the question about fear, mm. and I'm going to use the example of, of the Second World War and what we know about, about fear and how it manifested itself. If you look at, say, the Mass Observation Archive, it's a wonderful archive of, of qualitative data collected across the war years that we can really look at and, and mine for information about those mindsets. Fear is there, it, it's prevalent, but the way it's expressed, and there is a parallel here, is that to express fear in those circumstances is to seem to be working against the overall effort, against the national community spirit, to say I'm frightened outward, outwardly like that, and I'm worried we're going to be invaded. That was seen to be uh, that problematic in that you were unpatriotic, you were moving against the overall aim of pulling together resilient blitz spirit. So it was very much kept under the surface. Well, how did that fear get surfaced? Because you can't bottle all of that in. It's still there and busy. And that's where studying things like humour and rumours became a real insight for, for me as a researcher into how fear manifests itself and how it makes itself visible in circumstances where expressing fear is problematic for, for whatever, whatever reason. But if you look at rumours, there were lots of rumours expressing all the fears that one sees in mass observation, all the fears, but they're at a remove. I heard that. Could you tell me that? And, and where was going to be bombed was the top topic, that and rationing, top topic of rumours during the Second World War. Humour's another way. It's a way of deflecting it, making light of it, but you're still getting it out. You're still sharing it. So there's a kind of comparison here in the, the where fear sits at a time of crisis. And I think you can see a similar kind of humor, rumor, fear being sort of slightly suppressed, not feeling able to really share publicly, I'm frightened. That, that I think there, there's a parallel, but our experts about the, the present will be able to comment on, on whether that's true here. But from a historical perspective, from mm. Second World War perspective, that's certainly what we see. Okay, I'm gonna to go to um, some of our uh, questions from our audience. Um, and Brooke, if I may, I'm gonna th to throw two of, two of them in your direction. Um, Celia Allaby says, um, did the behavioral committee, I think she means Spivey, ever think that the actual government would find it difficult to follow the rules within Downing Street? And Lindsay, 
us what effect will Partygate, as it's called, have on future public acceptance of restrictions? Okay, thank you so much, Colin. And if I can be cheeky and quickly just reinforce what Joe was saying about fear and just say in the world of psychology, um, we would very much, uh, in health psychology, advise against the use of fear because it, it, instead of using risk communication to raise awareness and improve understanding of a risk or threat, whatever risk or threat that, that might be, the risk of cancer through smoking, et cetera, if you start using fear and using images that call, lead to fear, you're much, much more likely to make people feel overwhelmed as if they can't do something about it and to create a sense of fatalism. So you're more likely to see a decrease in the behaviors, the protective health behaviors you're trying to, to inform and trying to enable rather than an increase. So Joe, I just really liked that as a transition. Thinking about party gate, um, again, I can just put, embed this in a very long standing risk communication, risk perception literature where, um, and, and Franziska has already highlighted the importance of the role of trust. And, and back in the day when I was a PhD student, um, I, I remember there, there was data coming out showing that trust um, informs 50% of cooperation. And it's, it, it, it's a fundamental, um, foundation of what we need in order to um, bring about protective behaviors or to communicate in a way that people can engage with it, understand it and say, ah, yes, I, I'm going to engage in that protective health behavior. And so if the trust isn't there, then we're going to have an uphill struggle in terms of, of um, informing those behaviors, uh, uh, even to the point where if we offer support, people would actually take up that support. We also know from looking at the data, and if I think about the community champions work and, and a literature around engaging with um, communities where there are lower levels of trust between the community and governments, that, um, that leadership is incredibly important. But it's not always the traditional leadership that you would expect to see in terms of politicians leading the country. It's about um, seeing the behaviors that are being requested or advised or suggested and the people that these communities and individuals, everyday individuals like all of us, the people that we see as leaders in our communities, the bus drivers, the dentists, et cetera, et cetera. Who do you see as in being, a, as being in a position of authority? And if the bus drivers are wearing masks, it makes it easier for those who are getting onto the bus to feel that it's okay to wear a mask, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that we really have to think about who is a leader, and who are the leaders in which we want to put trust um, for the different communities because that varies. We also know that when we look across the, um, the emergency um, extreme events literature that the communicators and leadership that individuals want to hear from vary across throughout the course of an event from the beginning where they want to know very much operationally what to do um, um, what are the impacts on health and what can we do to protect our own health? As you move to the middle bit and people are more reassured and have greater certainty about what to do and how to protect their health, then they want to start understanding how was this allowed to happen and how prepared were we? Um, and, 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 and that's where you start seeing more of the blame creep in. And then there's a third segment where we start thinking about commemoration, et cetera, et cetera, and the narrative that we're going to have. So it's not just the policymakers who hold the trust. It's not just the policymakers who are seen as being leaders who, who need to have that trust in our communities. Quite often the different communities want to hear from other people. They weren't going to listen to the policymakers anyway. And quite often when we look at extreme events, we say, don't roll out the policymakers because they are not the most trusted communicators in that community. People want to hear from other people. So in a way, we kind of have that at working in our favor with things like Partygate and Dominic Cummings, that they are not the only voices, they are not the only leaders, and people are looking around them to model the behavior of the perceived and trusted leaders in their own world. Um, in terms of Partygate, um, in terms of Dominic Cummings, we would be going to the data um, to really, really look at the public response to that. We can see whether or not when, ad, when adverts um, like uh, look them in the eye type um, campaigns were put out, 
we actually saw very little public reaction in terms of anxiety, et cetera. So we can collect the data and that. Partygate is still so recent. I would look to my colleagues taking part in this conversation to look at what's hitting the headlines. But I would also then say that there's a lot of study, there are probably a lot of studies taking place right now and a lot of data monitoring to look at impacts on trust and impacts on behavior. And I can tell you that behavior is very complex. It's not just communication that impacts behavior. It's everything wrapped up around it, the context. And we are seeing quite significant decreases at the moment and people testing positive and saying that they're isolating significant decreases. Is that because of party gate? Possibly. Is that because of the rules changing? Probably, et cetera, et cetera. Is that because of testing? You know, it's not going to be free anymore. So there, we have to look at this as a multi-factor, multi, -factor, multi um, it's driven by so many variables. Will Partygate have an impact? I think that the instinct is that it will, but the proof is in the pudding. We have to look at what the data tells us. Thank you. Um, just, just for the record, as it were, um, an anonymous attendee makes the point, um, Francisca, that the um, chief executive of Hong Kong, who of course is a woman, um, did use the war narrative, although they also point out that it could, she could have been influenced by her boss in the People's Republic of China. Um, anyway, the, the thing, another really interesting question I thought, which perhaps I could throw in your direction, Francisca, as well, is this is Scott who says, do you think we should have something like the wartime D-notice system to try to prevent the media from, for example, reporting local fuel shortages, which we all know, says Scott, simply leads to panic buying on a national scale? Any thoughts about that? Um, I think one of the things that well that ties into something that Brooke said about the sort of fear and panic messaging, and I think um, in a way, um, I'm, my background is also in communication and media science, and I think sort of um, media reporting in various countries has been extremely different uh, different uh, during the pandemic. But I also think that um, there was a distinct um, narrative changing factor. So emanating from tabloid style news reporting. I don't think that the solution to this is to say, well, you know, let's ban every sort of communication like this. Um, I remember very distinctly that um, I live in Sheffield and um, where I live near a football station next to which is located a petrol station um, and that entire, which connects the entire city centre, which was closed on the day that the Sheffield Telegraph started live tweeting the various closures of petrol stations because of shortages, because somebody, took it upon themselves to overtake an oncoming traffic and then crash into the football stadium which was subsequently also closed um causing huge public outreach um but i think all of those various things that we can monitor that do have an impact such as narratives by whom they are um by whom they are spread whom they affect and how they affect behaviors is something that we can address on a larger level. Um, I think there's various um, effects such as the one you just mentioned um, that are symptomatic of things that are perhaps wrong with the media that we might think about in general with the sort of fast news, breaking news and so on culture. But this is something that can only be addressed, I think personally on a wider level, on a more institutional level through the um, use of committees and so on and so forth, um, such as the one that uh, Brooke is serving on. But also, I, I really like it. I would like to sort of jump on this point um, of uh, that Brooke made about community leaders. This is something I saw very um, distinctly um, when whenever I say to people that we were working with the Church of England, people always look to me like, you're a science communicator, why are you working with the church? Which is still a very sort of embedded response, but thinking about it, it's actually quite counterintuitive. A lot of people, the Church of England was swamped with inquiries, what does it mean? What should I do now? And church leaders want to be good at communicating this so of course they work together with people who can guide them in the right direction you know not just have the actual factual medical guidance but how to communicate this well and it was absolutely remarkable the role that churches played in the early pandemic in particular and um, in communicating this and listening to people and their very real distress but also they already have 
huge networks of volunteers of people who can actively spring into action and i'm sure if i um turn this over to brooke she might even have some data on it but um just imagining how many of us were vaccinated in a church um i was <laughs> um this is you know these are networks that you really want to tap into church leaders are trusted it is important that we provide them with really good um, guidance as experts and you know there's all sorts of community leaders like this and we should never be tempted to exclude any of them by default and uh, because that will only work against that because in a way we are all in this together and we should treat the crisis as such okay um it's amazing how quickly 60 minutes can fly past isn't it when uh, we're dealing with what, what is a, I think a fascinating subject and an enormous subject and we've i suppose only scratched the surface but sadly i do have to bring it to a close well i'm just going to ask each of our panelists i'm really going to ask you for a maximum of two sentences each if there's one thing that you think we've learned from the experience of, of the COVID pandemic in terms of you know communication in periods of crisis like this there's one thing that we would do differently in the future. Um, what would that be? Um, uh, Brooke? I would say invest in and build up those relationships so that they can be maintained on a local level. They can feed data in, they can, they can uh, translate data back, and they really have their finger on the pulse. We know this. We always know this. But we have to make it sustainable. OK. And Joe? <clears throat> I think look look to the unusual sources um, that that might tell a slightly different story. The the rumor, the humor, the you know that might surface some of the private opinion polling. It might be a bit different in that that that's what you'd be prepared to say to to say in public. So go under the surface and see what that might reveal. And uh, Francisca. <clears throat> Um, I would just really like to stress that communication, the humanities, the arts are absolutely crucial in the endeavor of tackling medical crisis. This is something that very often goes under medical crisis is for medical people only the times that we have been taught you don't have a stage here you're not important i hope what we can take away from tonight's event is really how important communication narrative research those skills are in society and for future pandemic preparedness and if i may add finally we can learn from history okay and well, that's a good uh, good point on which to finish so can i just thank our three panelists brooke rogers joe fox and francisca colt for their contributions and their ex sharing their expertise with us. It's been fascinating. Thank you to all of you who have joined us um, and for your questions. I think we've got through a fair number of them. Some great questions there. Um, and let me just remind you that um, this talk will be available on YouTube in the coming days um, and you will get an email notifying you of that so you can watch it again if you want to and share it with your friends and colleagues. Um, thank you again to all of you um, and I wish everybody a safe journey if you've got to make a journey if not um, enjoy the rest of the time thank you very much for joining us <laughs>